Framed from 1947 was a very entertaining crime noir film featuring Glenn Ford as a fella just trying to get his life started again, but who just happens to fall for the wrong girl and winds up in a ton of trouble too. You know, the type of things that generally happen in these crime noir classics. Well, film opens up with Ford's character Mike, and he's frantically driving this big truck. Kind of seems like it's out of control or something, like the brakes aren't working. Incidentally, it looks a lot like the one that carried the Ark of the Covenant in Raiders of the Lost Ark. But anyhow, he arrives in town, smacks into a guy's fender, and we find out that he's a delivery driver and the truck had some brake issues. The guy with the damaged truck wants payment, and Gled Ford gives him a buck, and then after a pause, as cold as ice, takes it back again. It's a great scene. Well, he goes into a bar, and he talks with the gorgeous Paula, played by actress Janice Carter. But he is soon arrested and brought before a judge for those shenanigans with driving so fast. And he's about to be thrown in jail when, last minute, Paula shows up and tosses down his $50 of bail money. What's going on here? Well, Mike gets good and plastered, and Paula sees to it that he gets a room to sleep it off, and then goes through his wallet. Then she gets dressed up and leaves town to meet with this mysterious fellow, Stephen, played really well here by actor Barry Sullivan, a very creepy character. And the two of them talk about how she found this man that they can use for their scheme. Something mysterious involving extorting money. Hmm, well, they're up to something, these tricksy hobbitses. Well, Steve heads home, back to his wife, Beth. And Steve, you cad. Beth suspects that something is going on with Steve, and he won't admit it. And he just acts all cheeky about it. So we can kind of see that this guy is a real slime ball. Well, we cut to the character Mike. He's hungover, and he's just waking up. He looks in pretty bad shape. He's possibly regretting his decisions and thinking maybe about settling down somewhere on a farm like Smallville. Oh, okay, I added that little bit there. Well, anyhow, he heads downstairs and talks to the desk clerk to find out what time it is. And it was interesting, the desk clerk was played here by Art Smith in a very brief role. I caught him recently. He was Bogart's mousy little friend in the film, In a Quiet Place. Well. Mike goes to a local mining place and asks about a job and speaks with Sandy, actor Paul Burns, who is an assayer. Rob, what's an assayer? Well, I'm glad you asked. An assayer is one who provides qualitative or quantitative analysis of a metal or that of an ore to determine its components. It can also refer to the process of taking a subject, a metal for example, to undergo chemical analysis so as to determine the strength or quality of its components. Uh, but in this film, it basically just means an old guy who might have a job for Glenn Ford. And soon enough, he meets with a character Jeff, who is played by Edgar Buchanan, you know, Uncle Joe Carson from Petticoat Junction. And he's just a jolly old fellow here in the film, and he and Mike hit it off, and he gives him a job. By the way, this is the same Jeff from earlier in the film that Mike had smacked into the fender of his truck. But <laughs> I guess, you know, he... Water under the bridge, and they're all buddies now. But, alas, Paula comes to visit Mike, and after giving him some sugar, finds out that he's planning on leaving town. Well, she can't have any of this because it goes against her schemes. So she heads to the phone quickly and gets through to Stephen, who works at the bank, and makes sure that he prevents Uncle Joe, that, I mean Jeff, from getting the loan that he needs for the mine. Now, don't read into this film too much because... It's pretty amazing timing to all of this, but hey, it's all good. So Jeff gets turned down for his loan for the mine, and he seems, you know, very disappointed. And this leaves him and Mike in quite a pickle, as they're unable to get started together on their partnership working in this silver mine. And that basically leaves Mike trapped in this town. So Mike heads to a bar, as you would expect, and he looks really cool lighting smoke. But he finds out that Paula has quit the previous night. So he goes to see her. And there's some soft music as they talk. And seems like she's still playing him. Because the next day, she goes with Stephen to work out the plans of their crime. Looking over a cliff, she says, For the first time, I really believe it's going to happen. Yeah, this, this lady has bad news. However, Steve drops her off in town. And Mike, who has been hiding in the shadows... He's finally figured that something fishy is going on. 
He pawns his watch and then goes upstairs in this bar to play craps and almost instantly makes a ton of money. And then he takes his winnings and goes to see Paula and just sort of angrily pays her off, you know, for the bond money and giving him a place to stay and so on. And he's really annoyed. Now she's confused, but she goes fully into her deception that she had merely persuaded Steve to reconsider Jeff's financing and poor Mike, the sap, he falls for it. Well, the next day, Mike, Paula, and Steven, they take a drive out to inspect the mine. Following this, they head to Steven's secretive house. And it's here, while washing his hands, that Mike sees the bathrobe hanging up with the name Paula on it in big letters. You know, you might want to be a little more discreet and subtle about things like that, Paula. You know, putting your name on a robe. So Mike puts two and two together that there's something going on with Paula and Steven. And Steven also realizes that he's become aware of this. The two of them are conspiring in the kitchen while Mike drinks and gets drunk. So there was briefly some great tension growing there, but now we're at a point where Mike is in a drunken state. They leave, and as they reach the place where they are going to commit their crime, Paula slowly removes a wrench and bops Stephen on the head, and then sends his car with him over a cliff, and then she returns home with Mike. Now, this is about the 58 minute mark in the film, and you know, I debated any of the review here, but wait a minute, there's still like 20 minutes left, so what is going on here? This film, to its credit, has a lot of strange twists and turns, and you never really know what's going on from one minute to the next. Well, the next day, the bank is closed due to the death of Stephen. Paula goes to talk to Mike, and the twist, she tells him, is that he killed Stephen while he was drunk, and gets him convinced of it, and that he can't go to the police either. Oh man, she is quite the femme fatale in this film. And Mike, you know, he's just all gloomy. I'm back where I started, nowhere. Poor guy, he can't get a break. Mike finds out that Jeff was accused and meets with the poor guy in jail. And he tells him that he's gonna get to the bottom of all of this and then goes to speak with the bank secretary, you know, pretending to be with the press so that he can ask a bunch of questions. She confirms that someone named Helen Bailey had called while Jeff was meeting Steve at the bank. And that's the clue he needs. But her suspicious husband calls the police and then Mike is suddenly on the run. And what will happen? Will he make it? Will he fall for the wiles of the gorgeous yet deceptive Paula? And wow, what an ending to this film. So no spoilers, go and check this one out for yourself. I mean, to be honest, I think there were a couple copies on YouTube. It may or may not be in the public domain, I don't know. Some closing thoughts on this, and this is one of the finest of the femme fatale themed noir films I've seen. Janice Carter is amazing as the gorgeous yet manipulative woman who just wraps these guys around her fingers. I mean, it's great stuff, and there are plenty of twists and turns throughout the film. And to me, it was never quite what I expected it to be. And that's the mark of a good film, I think. The film Framed has been compared to the film Gilda from 1946, which also featured Glenn Ford, but in that film he's paired with the legendary Rita Hayworth. So I definitely need to check that film out and put that on my list. This film was neat to me because as I've mentioned in previous reviews of films with Glenn Ford, I still sort of perceive him as this all-American wholesome character, you know, living in Smallville, giving advice to young Clark Kent, you know, stuff like that. But here in this film, he's plenty jaded, edgy, and cynical. And I'm really anxious to see more of this other side of his acting. Although, you know, to be honest, I will always think of him most fondly as the, you know, as a man gets older, he thinks very differently and things get very clear. So interesting to see a different angle of his acting. Great stuff here. And the film was directed by Richard Wallace. And I think it had some notable music by Marlon Skiles. It's filled with plenty of good romantic music, tension music. And of course, the performances by Glenn Ford and Janice Carter were great. And that's the film Framed, excellent crime noir movie, and it is worth checking out.